Hello everyone and welcome to Art and Science Communicating the Climate Emergency brought to you by National Museum Scotland. My name is Sam Alberti, I'm Director of Collections here at the museums which is a great job um, but not only that I also have the privilege of uh, coordinating the public offer, our exhibitions, our events, our schools programmes around the what we call our sustainability um, area, which includes not only uh, the climate emergency and how we might respond, respond to that, but also biodiversity loss. And that's what we're going to tackle here tonight in a really interesting and varied um, event. And it's really nice to welcome you here from, as far as we can tell, all corners of the globe to talk about this really, really important, um, uh, these really important issues facing us today. And we hope as uh, pandemic measures ease up, those of you who are able to, will be able to come back to our museums over the coming months to see our diverse collections and perhaps even to visit some of the exhibits and artworks we'll be talking about um, this evening. But in the meantime, welcome, and I'm very glad you're able to join us from the comfort of your own home. To give a bit of context, it may have come to your attention that Glasgow is currently hosting COP26, which is all about climate change, as you know. But here at the National Museums, we're as interested in biodiversity loss, in the biodiversity crisis, as we are in the climate emergency. So we were just as interested in COP15, which was held in China earlier in the year. And this event tonight is about that juxtaposition of climate change and the challenges this brings and biodiversity loss and what we can do about this, um, the environmental changes we're experiencing um, with alarming rapidity um, over recent years. And it might be odd to think of a museum, uh, some would view us as a dusty mausoleum, it's a, we're a two centuries old collection. What is it that we can bring um, to, to these events and these um, challenges that are going on at the moment. And that's what this evening is about. We'll be talking about science, we'll be talking about technology, and we'll be talking about art. But first of all, we're going to focus on our natural science collections, our natural history collections. Over our entire collections, we have 12.5 million items, and many of those are invertebrates, that is to say animals without a backbone, which include worms, mollusks, corals, jellyfish, other glamorous entities like this. This is a very large area, but tonight we're going to focus on some of the smaller members of, of, of um, this part of the animal kingdom, and that's insects. So there's a great deal we can learn from our huge collection of insects um, tonight, and um, we're going to introduce you, first of all, um, to my colleague Ashley Whiffin, as well as artist Luke Jerram. Now we'll come back to, to Luke in, in just a moment, um, but first of all, if we think about um, the insect collections we have at the museum, um, Ashley uh, will first of all explain to us via a short video as to why the museum collects insects. <laughs> I'm Ashley Whiffin, I'm Assistant Curator of Entomology at National Museum of Scotland and we are here in the Entomology Collection um, based down in Granton at the National Museum's Collection Centre. So in all these cabinets here behind me we've got about two and a half million insect specimens. Now, that might seem like a lot but in the grand scheme of things there is an estimated 10 quintillion insects in the world. Now to put that into a context that would mean that for every human that exists on the planet you'd each be assigned 1.4 billion insects. And in terms of different kinds of insects, so far scientists have described over a million different species. So insects are absolutely everywhere and they perform many vital functions. Um, take the dung beetles, for instance. They are incredible at recycling. That is their role. Um, they're amazing at getting rid of that natural waste product and helping break it down and bury it within the soil feed it to their young, their young become food for birds, other animals, um, and the cycle continues. There's an estimated 14,000 different species of insect in Scotland, and our collection is obviously very rich in Scottish material, but we've got specimens from all over the world. Our collection is very active, and each year we go out and conduct fieldwork 
bringing back thousands of new specimens, it's not possible to just take photographs out in the wild. Many insects are very, very small, and some of the things that help tell them apart from one another might actually be characters on the inside, so you might have to dissect specimens. You can think about the collection uh, a little bit like a library. It's a library of biodiversity. So really, as curators, what we're doing is we are um, collecting and organising uh, the world's insect biodiversity. Each specimen in the collection has a series of labels underneath, and these are equally as important as the insect itself. This is the important information about where the insect was found, when it was found, who collected it, information about habitat, potentially plants or anything the insect was associated with. And by having a large series of them that's been developed over the last 200 years, we also have time series data. So we can actually see how species distributions are changing over time. So this library of insects is used by a large number of researchers every year. Um, and they're coming to study the specimens, maybe for help with identification, but they're also interested in all that data that is associated with the insects. Well, thanks for that. A fascinating glimpse into the insect collections we've got. Ashley, I wonder if you could follow on from that um, and talk us through what the collection can tell us about the main threats to biodiversity. Threats to biodiversity is a big, big topic, Sam. Um, I mean, there are so many, and especially, especially for insects, they're really being threatened at all different angles. Um, so where to start? Firstly, habitat loss. That's a big driver of these insect declines that we're seeing. Um, so this can be through a, a variety of different mechanisms, deforestation, exploitation of habitats, urbanisation and general land use change, often um, in terms of agricultural use. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is pesticides. Um, obviously, pesticides are insects are exposed to pesticides through many different parts of the landscape. Um, and now we have climate change as well. So really they're under attack from all these different elements and it's, it's no wonder that they are declining. And our collections can give us this information on um, these population trends and changes over time. So that's what all that data in our collections um, is being used for at the moment. Um, but surely, you know, these are just insects. How's, how's that going to affect humans? You know? Oh, just I mean, insects. We're not talking about cuddly pandas here. They're just, they're just deer with them. <laughs> It's so true. So much of conservation works focus, focuses on the massive megafauna, right? The huge fluffy things, the big things. They, uh, they get far too much of the limelight, but really it's the bottom of the food chain that is the essential, essential kind of um, things that run the world. So insects, they are at the bottom of the food chain, which means that many, many other life forms rely on them. They depend on them. So not only are they a food source to many, many other animals, they are providing a huge number of services for us that we completely take for granted. The main one that most people will know about is pollination. So pollination services provided by a variety of different insects, not just bees. Um, and that is providing our food source as well. So they're food for other animals, but they're also enabling um, our food to be created too. So insects pollinate 75% of the crops that we eat, and particularly this is a lot of our fruit and vegetables. So without them, say goodbye to your strawberries, say goodbye to all those delightful fruit and veg. Um, and then of course, they're providing these other services like recycling. Insects are nature's best recyclers. Uh, so they are breaking down any organic waste matter. That's everything from dung, dead bodies, decaying wood, leaves, everything. So without them, our environment would look completely different. And what you've described there is all about kind of living insects and insects now, but surely those millions of specimens we have in the collections are all historic. I mean, they're just, they're just old stuff. How's that gonna help us? 
Not true. They are not all old. So our oldest specimens probably date back to about 230 years ago. Um, but the co collection has developed over this 200 year period. So we are continually growing the collection, which means that we have specimens that we've collected just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's really important that it continues to grow so that it's representative of these of the um, of, of the change in time um, and it continues to be relevant and useful. Well, thanks, Ashley. We'll come back to you with lots more questions later on, and I'm sure uh, uh, our audiences will have will have questions to follow on from that um, as well. Um, but in a moment, I'm going to bring in um, artist Luke Jerram. But just to give a bit of context for that, National Museum of Scotland is a multidisciplinary museum. So not only do we have scientists and science collections, we've also got um, decorative arts and we've got design and we've got um, all sorts of things across the disciplinary spectrum and one of the ways we want to create these spaces for people to learn and share ideas in a different way to to other places and other media is to do through to talk about these scientific concepts through through contemporary art and that's one reason why we're so delighted to work with um, the artists we'll be talking about tonight um, the first of which is, um, is artist Luke Jerram, who creates sculptures, installations and live arts projects, many of which tour internationally and are very striking. And yet he's been described as probably the most famous um, artist you've never heard of um, until tonight, that is. So I want to hand over now to Luke for him to tell us more about uh, um, him to tell us more about his work. Luke. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. Hope you can all hear me. Um, an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've got a few slides. I've been making that artwork now for about 25 years. And more recently, I suppose, it's become more and more about the environment and the climate crisis. So this was um, a flotilla of fishing boats I put in the middle of Lee Woods in Bristol um, uh, for people to sort of stumble across. And this was part of the green capital of culture uh, 20, 2015 really um, and the boats they're all bought, bought on eBay uh, for a couple hundred quid and we put them in there on, uh, it was a commission for the National Trust and people sort of stumbled across them and were sort of startled to ask the question how on earth did they get there um, the boats were interesting because they they weren't really worth very much because they didn't really have a value as fishing boats anymore and in part, they didn't have a value as fishing boats because there were less fish in the sea. These, these boats weren't financially viable. And it's because there's less fish in the sea. These days, fishing is done on a massive scale with huge trawlers. The boats, uh, could we have the next slide to see if that works? There we are. This, um, so the boats were this, um, acted as an installation for people to explore, but also as a venue for events to take place. So we had um, lectures on climate change and, and overfishing and we had a uh, film nights and choirs performing um, and lots of my projects do that they leave space for other people to be creative and at the end the, 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 they were there for like um, I think about three months we doubled the number of people going into the woods over that period of time and at the end of the project we gave the boats away so they they became sort of play equipment for schools and play groups and things like that um, Let's see if that works. <clears throat> okay, so you might, th this is the uh, another artwork that I'm touring and it's a replica of the earth, seven meters in diameter uh, and slowly turns. Now, if you've been watching coverage on uh, the news of COP, you might spot my earth in the upper COP in Glasgow in the blue zone. So it's been used lots and lots on TV at the moment as a sort of backdrop for data and news reports, which I'm delighted about. Um, so this installation is designed to get people to have the hard conversations that we all need to do around climate change and saving the planet. It also, again, acts as a venue for events to take place. Um, and we're touring these uh, around the world. They get presented in all sorts of different contexts. So they're going into cathedrals and they're going into science museums and uh, they're going to light festivals. And wherever they go, that interpretation sort of changes slightly. Um, so this is a, an image of it outside. It's all made of high resolution NASA imagery. It's designed to help inspire, to give people a sense of what it might be like to be an astronaut. Um, this is an art project I did for Extinction Rebellion. They had a little, in fact, I think I funded it myself. We went around with a stencil 
um, I which created an image of a set of, set of lungs. We used a high pressure power hose, which was solar powered and battery powered uh, to clean um, the, the roads and the walls around Bristol. So this is uh, an artwork made of the abs absence of dirt and pollution. Um, and we, we sort of hit, sort of, uh, sort of popped up in several locations across the city. That's been quite fun. Um, and yes, more recently, the extinction bell. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to present this artwork in the National um, Museum in Scotland. I'm really delighted and very chuffed about it. Um, and it came about really through finding out that there's somewhere between 150 and 200 extinctions of a species lost each day. And I wanted a way to sort of highlight that. And that statistic came from a 2007 United Nations report. And that's the problem with, with science sometimes and data is it can be a bit, people don't sort of grasp it. It's hard to visualize. So by paint, putting a bell that has a timer that dings automatically, I'm hoping it sort of creates a sense of, the sense of urgency perhaps, is that the notion of what a bell means and its symbolism. Uh, and what's wonderful actually about the, the bell at the, 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 the museum in Scotland is they're using a, um, an old fire engine bell, which is brilliant. So that there's really that sense of urgency and a sense of alarm. And it's in their main space, um, dinging, dinging along. Um, and this was, these are photographs of when it was presented in Bristol Zoo um, last year. Uh, and more recently, I've put the bell in this um, artwork called the Palm Temple, which I've made and it's sort of inspired um, by nature and sacred architecture. And you can walk inside it and it's mirrored top and bottom. So it has this sort of optical effect. And there's a bell in, in the apex of the roof that, that rings. Um, so instead of it being like a kind of a cathedral, uh, where you're sort of honouring God. This is the idea of a sort of a cathedral to nature, inspired by nature. Um, I suppose, and I, my work is incredibly diverse, um, but yeah, more and more, it seems that we all have to do what we can to fight the climate crisis and help nature and try to live more sustainably, I suppose. Um, and I'm hoping through the communication, um, uh, and my work as an artist, I can help scientists communicate their work. Okay, I think that's enough for me for the time being. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think the, uh, I'm sure the audience would agree this is, these are fascinating works you've introduced us to, and I'm really struck by the parallels. You might not think so, but there's the parallels I'd like to draw out now between the contemporary science and the historic collections that, uh, that Ashley was talking about and the long durée art um, that, that you're working with and the, the deep history you're talking about and you know using the, the historic bell um, from our collections I think was a was a really nice touch um, and certainly one thing that clearly in terms of your fields and you as individuals, one thing, two things you share, one thing that you two share is a curiosity to understand the unknown. I wonder, Ashley first, and perhaps then Luke, Ashley, if you could talk to us, how important do you think the relationship is between science and contemporary art? Oh, it's really, really important. Um, but not just contemporary, the connection between art and science dates back really 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 far um it was the early naturalists that first used art to document nature so back to like 17th century maria marion documenting metamorphosis of insects uh, but now um it's still as important in documenting um entomology at least um in artists um not just artists but scientists use illustration to document new species so despite photography being phenomenal now um it's actually hand-drawn illustrations that are used to document certain morphological features within um scientific publications so that's really important but then of course um more mainstream art <laughs> not just scientific art is really 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 essential at the moment to portray some of these really important messages in messages such as insects being incredibly important and essential to ecosystems and to us 
So really, really important to, re to reach a more broad audience so that the scientists don't just communicate within their circles. They can reach the general public and reach and engage a wider audience. Luke, if I may, I mean, clearly you've already outlined the ways in which um, uh, nature and the environment inform your your work. I mean, you must think a great deal about the links between, between science and art. Yeah, I do. Um, and I've come to realize over time that actually I have a, there's a, there's a real value for artists to, to help scientists um, communicate their work. Some scientists are absolutely brilliant at communicating um, their work to the general public, but there's a, a good percentage that are absolutely rubbish and it's not their fault. You know, they've spent 30 years studying their particular field. They shouldn't necessarily be amazing at these things. So, um, there is a role there for artists to be able to help them communicate that that research and also one of the things that we're doing we can we can communicate scientific concepts in a different way and i think um you know if you've got some complicated bit of science uh if you can communicate it through a radio program through a sculpture um uh, through graphs um you know through television through a film documentary it all counts basically um and that that's gonna hit and be suitable for different audiences because people need different things because we're all different so there's a there is a role definitely especially as we enter this climate crisis it's a it's a case of um all hands on deck basically we all have to do what we can Brilliant. Well, thanks, Luke, and, and thanks, Ashley. I'm sure there'll be lots more questions um, uh, for you both um, at our Q&A session at the end. But I'm keen now, and you mentioned, Luke, the climate crisis just in your in your closing there. I'm keen now to introduce um, another artist and another curator um, uh, to, the, to the digital stage here. Um, Ellie Swinbank is our Curator of Technology here at National Museums of Scotland, and artist Philip Pinsky is co-creator co of an, art an artwork known as An If Not Now When, and If Not Now When, which um, in contrast to, to Luke's Extinction Bell, um, is a sound and film installation currently also on display um, at the National Museum of Scotland. So we've just been talking about the uh, threats to biodiversity and how research and creativity and art can, can assist in communicating this urgent message. I want now to, to turn to Ellie and talk about the, not art, but, uh, uh, but science, not, not nature, but, but culture, and talk about technological solutions to climate change. Now, this might seem quite a big leap from our last discussion, but you'll see it this this loop around over the course of the session. Um, so, Ellie, um, uh, you've been uh, you've curated. I, I get created and curated are very difficult words to distinguish. But Ellie's just created. Ha, case in point, Ellie has just curated a new exhibition on display at National Museum of Scotland called Scotland's Climate Challenge, and I think we're going to hear about that now. Industry has played a crucial role in Scotland's development and wealth over the last three centuries, and this is reflected in the collections at National Museum Scotland. Crucial to the growth of industry was the development of the steam engine. Thomas Newcomen's engine was the first that could effectively be used to drain water from mine workings, making it possible to mine deeper than ever before, producing coal and other minerals that were necessary for industrial expansion. Scott, James Watt, improved the efficiency of the steam engine with the invention of his separate condenser, which was patented in 1769. The work of Newcomen, Watt and others enabled coal to be extracted and burned in far greater quantities than ever before, and this was a main foundation of the Industrial Revolution, helping to shape Scotland and indeed the world as they are today. However, the extraction and burning of fossil fuels has left a legacy of pollution and caused society to be reliant on them for practically all aspects of life, from travel to heating to manufacturing. Carbon emissions are causing the planet to warm and the climate to change. This is a pivotal moment in time at which we must vastly reduce our carbon emissions in order to minimise permanent harm to the planet. 
Scotland's landscape and climate mean that it is well placed to develop and use renewable forms of energy, such as wind, solar and marine power. With abundant wave and tidal power resources, Scotland has been at the forefront of marine energy technology for decades, with the first effective marine energy converter pioneered at the University of Edinburgh in the 1970s. However, these new technologies have their own environmental impacts and it is important to fully understand them so that they can be used responsibly. The ADV sensor head is part of the Environmental Research Institute's project to study the environmental and ecological effects of installing and operating marine energy devices and arrays. The project monitors the environment around devices and tracks the behaviour of fish, seabirds and marine mammals. Its results will help to inform planning of future installations. Of course, no technology on its own is a solution to the climate emergency. Politics, society and culture all need to embrace the desire to change. For example, many people are starting to use sustainable transport options and new technologies are being developed, such as the Lutz self-driving car that is on display in the museum. But town planning and infrastructure are needed to make such solutions viable and increased use of public transport and active travel are at least as important, but need to be as accessible and attractive to all. The climate emergency needs to be addressed urgently, but it is within all of our power to make a difference through our actions and choices, and the range of research, innovation and amazing work showcased in the collections at National Museum Scotland shows that there are new developments all the time that, if used correctly, will help. Ali, it's a fascinating um, piece of work. Um, thank you for that. And as you know, I'm really interested in the relationship between our historic and our contemporary collections. And this is coming, coming back over and again, um, even just this evening. Um, the Industrial Revolution shaped you know, Scotland and, and a great deal of the world as, as we know it. Um, do you think these renewables that you're talking about, do you think those can redefine the future? That's a big question, isn't it, Sam? Um, I think when it comes to energy and climate, there isn't one single thing in isolation that will define the future. Um, but as I think that as we're all very aware of at the moment, the choices that we make on all levels at the moment will have an impact on what the future will look like. And there is no doubt that renewable energy technologies will play a big part in that, and they already are, um, as will various other technologies such as carbon capture and storage and transport solutions. But what will really define the future is the decisions that everyone from world leaders through to individuals make now and in the next few years, and the cultural shifts and attitudes that those will shape. Of course, from a museum perspective, it's difficult to collect and display those intangible things, but we can use objects associated with things like renewable technologies, and not only to learn about what they are and how they work, but also as a jumping off point to talk about wider issues like the context for their development and the impact that they're having. You mentioned just now the new technologies and, and how they can be used responsibly, but how easy is it to test their environmental impact? Can you give us a bit of an idea as to what's involved there? Uh, yes, and that's something that the, the, the exhibition looks at in, in a couple of cases. Unfortunately, I think it's very complex as these technologies are relatively new. So in some cases, we don't know how wide ranging their impact has the potential to be. Um, the Climate Challenge Exhibition highlights the work of the Environmental Research Institute studying the impact of tidal energy in installations on marine environments and ecosystems. And not, not only is that really multifaceted research using a wide range of complex technologies um, to, for example, measure changes in water flow and turbulence, um, but just the very fact that these environment, that the environments that they're studying are difficult to access and potentially dangerous makes it all the more challenging. Um, other work that we highlight in the exhibition is the RSPB's study of the impact of wind farms on bird behaviour, uh, which is also challenging to study and is just one way in which wind farm technologies can have an, an effect on the environment. It's necessary to understand all of the possible impacts and how they interact and their knock-on effects um, and to learn how they can be mitigated or balanced by the positive effects of using these technologies. 
the exhibition is all the more impressive, if I may say, Ellie, that you prepared a great deal of it during um, in the last um, uh, couple of years during lockdown. Um, and the lockdown not only not only did it impinge upon museum work, of course, but it also uh, showed us the phenomenal social and cultural changes um, that can happen very very quickly when when the need is pressing. Um, so the the social and cultural changes needed to address climate change have been highlighted further, I think, by lockdown. There's a very particular moment uh, we've been living in. Artists Philip Pinsky and Karen Lamond responded to the experience of lockdown and the urgency of this moment I've spoken about by creating a sound and film installation that shows how we might transform our cities to make our streets more equal and accessible and, crucially, for the current purposes, to mitigate the impending climate crisis. As I mentioned, it's called And If Not Now, When? And the installation access asks us if we want to go back to where we were or if we want to use the experiences of the last couple of years to create a different urban reality. Now, we're very privileged to have Philip with us here tonight. Um, but first, let's see a short trailer to tell us more about this fascinating piece. During lockdown, traffic stopped. Walking along the streets, I could hear birds and see buildings that had been hidden by traffic or unnoticed as we negotiated the busy streets and sidewalks. In the quiet, I realised we have a choice. We could help the environment and ourselves by reclaiming these streets for us and for our children. It's not a matter of what or even how we can do this. It's just a question of when. We have to do something big right now or it might be too late. That's fascinating context, Philip, and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the work itself? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here tonight and also that when we planned this uh, almost a year ago, we didn't have a venue and um, to be in the National Museum of Scotland when we have a piece of work which is about improving the city for the community, it, it couldn't be a better place to be because I think it's the one place in the city that everyone uses. So, um, and. Also, I think it would make more sense if I explained the inspiration. So I'm a composer and sound designer. I work mostly in theatre, but I do a lot of site-specific work outside. And working outside with sound, you become very aware of the fact that it, um, there's a lot of noise going on all the time, and it's quite oppressive. Um, and it, it creates a high... It has a, a detrimental effect on your, your mental health, I would say. And then the other thing that fed into it is that I've grown up in the city as a non-car driver. I brought up a family. I've had to look after elderly relatives. And it makes you realise that the space, public space, is not distributed fairly. Or, and, and we have um, unfairness built into our cities. So these were the two things that were there. And then we had lockdown. And suddenly both that um, inequality of distribution of space and the noise went away almost overnight. And even though our ability to move around was restricted by new laws, um, there was actually a sense of freedom when we went outside. You know, suddenly we could walk wherever we wanted, we could cycle or scoot wherever we wanted, and also we could hear that it, there was an increased sense of community because we could hear each other talking, we could talk to our neighbours, we could talk to strangers, when before, even if you're standing a foot or two away from someone, it was quite hard to hear what they were saying. So that's, that's what 
inspired the work and what we wanted to do was make something that contrasted that sense of freedom um peace and community that we had during lockdown we want to contrast that with what we've how we've chosen to build our cities so the installation itself is a it's a sound and film um interactive immersive experience you're surrounded on all sides you it's all from the viewpoint of being in the center of the road and as you go through it you change the your environment around you so your your movement changes what you see and it goes from how things are to how things could be with if we thought a bit more how we would like our cities to be thanks so much that that really helps to make it clear especially for those folk who haven't had the chance to to visit it yet um i wonder and this will be a question to you as well ellie in a moment but what what do you want to see happen uh, with with your artwork, what do you want the result to be? What's the what's the call to action for? If not now, when? I guess we want people to embrace change. You know, there are changes that we have to make. I think there are two strands to this. One is that we want we need to change so that our cities are. We need to change for our own health and for the health of everyone. I mean, right now, our cities are hostile environments. And there are things that we could do that are quite simple. They've been tried and tested in other places. They're, they're, they're not big structural changes. They're not expensive, but they make, this, they make the city become a more democratic place for everyone. So we need, to do, we need to do it for ourselves, but we also need to do it as a contribution to tackling the climate crisis. Because uh, I mean, Scotland's biggest contribution is uh, motor traffic. So if we can do something about that then that that will make you know make the, a bigger difference than anything else and early i think the, the same question to you what would you like to see happen as a result of of scotland's climate challenge um well i hope that the exhibition inspires hope and gives people faith that humankind has the ability to use science and technology to come up with real feasible solutions to the climate emergency. But I hope that it also encourages people to be critical and nuanced and to realize that no, sim that no solution is simple and without consequences itself. Um, and I guess in terms of a, of a call to action, it would be to encourage people to think about their own role in all of this, which might be going on to found the next big marine energy company or it might be using a bike more often rather than taking the car. It's all important and it's all part of the same push towards a more sustainable future. Uh, well, I'm not sure I'll, I'm, I'm quite in a position to found a marine energy company, but I will certainly, you know, I certainly can use my, my, my bike more. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I mean, Philip, uh, I was thinking when in reflecting on your work about the, the busyness of the cities and the constant barrage of, of noise and we get this to just even thinking and talking about um, the climate emergency is there's there's just an awful lot of traffic in in the media and in, in the all the channels we're on but I wonder if I wonder if, if art do you think art brings a bit of clarity do you think it, it encourages us to to stop and consider and to reflect uh, absolutely I, th I think art allows us to inhabit other people's experience, other people's ideas in a way that nothing else does really. I mean, I think we were essentially non-rational beings. So even though we science, statistics, news, all these things are essential for change. I think to get behavioral change, which is what we're talking about, people need to change their behavior if we're to survive. I think we can do it more effectively through art than almost anything else because we can because it connects emotionally and I think that's what people respond to. Well thank you Philip, that's, you put it very eloquently as as, as we would hope. Um, but look, um, I'm conscious that we, we still have Luke and Ashley with us and I'm also conscious we've got people from around the world bursting uh, with with questions for the for the four of you. So um, I wonder if um, the four of you would be happy to respond to some some questions from the audience. 
And I'll kick off with one for, for, the, for the two curators, um, um, if I may. And this has come from, from one of our um, participants. Um, Ashley and Deli, are there particular artists or, or art forms uh, you think would be interested to work with in the future um, to explore these topics in particular within the museum? Um, and Ashley, do you want to go first? Artists. Oh, um, I, I really love photography, so I would love to see uh, some insect photography uh, exhibition at NMS. That would be really fantastic. Uh, you may have heard of the Microsculpture exhibition by Levon Biss. If you haven't, I would recommend going to look at his website. But something like that, um, that shows the, that really puts you at the level of insects. Look at the world through their eyes, look at other insects through their eyes, and look at those minute details. I mean, it really helps change your perception um, and realise how fantastic insects are, something like that. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Ellie, did you have any thoughts? I think it would be really fun to, to do some work with sculpture and possibly to use objects reclaimed perhaps from decommissioned industrial installations, possibly decommissioned bits of the, the fossil fuel sector to create artworks that look back at our industrial past and connect that in some way to a more sustainable, greener future. Um, I, I think it would be really fun to experiment with that and to, to host something like that in the museum at some point. Well, we're, we're bursting with ideas, but given that, you know, uh, never mind thinking about the, our future art collaborations, we've got, uh, given we've got two of our, our current collaborators here with us this evening, I'm, I'm interested, one parallel, um, I think, I hope you'll agree, between your work is that you, um, uh, neither of you kind of lecture, neither of you preach um, at, at your audiences with the sort of work that you do. Um, how important is, is playfulness and well-being and sort of uh, meditation to, to the sort of work that you give us? Um, and I'll aim that at Philip first. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the point of what we've done here and I think of anything we did, it, it's to make people look... Right now, what we're talking about is changing behaviour. And I think some people feel that they're, they may have stuff taken away from them, that they may be getting deprived by these changes. And actually, I think a lot of what we're asking people to do will be something that makes their, their lives and other people's lives better. So what we want, that, that's what we want to do, is present something that, that isn't... isn't uh, telling them off for misbehavior but is is something that they look at it and they think oh, I'd, I'd like some of that you know i'd like that change to happen and then luke yeah I, I, well i'd certainly agree with that um you know if you've ever driven an electric car you realize just how cool they are it's a really nice thing to drive and um and you know whenever i give up meat for a week or two i feel so much better and where if I don't cycle every day and I decide to drive, I suddenly start feeling a bit yucky and a bit ill. So actually, yeah, it, a lot of it is um, positive, uh, the positive changes that we need to make that is just better for us. Um, but yeah, a lot of the artwork I make isn't too preachy. I mean, some of it, a little, perhaps the extinction bell is a little bit, a bit scary, but most of the artwork I make, it tries to sort of, have multiple doors of entry. So if you're a four-year-old child and you see this earth artwork, you're going to really enjoy it as a, you know, a first encounter with the earth, perhaps, that you've, that you've never seen before. Whereas um, I've had scientists in tears where they've studied, you know, the surface of the earth uh, as um, an oceanographic scientist or a marine biologist and suddenly they can see this thing in front of them turning in the gallery space and they get all emotional about it so um so it means different things to different people depending on what they bring to it a lot of the artworks i make they they're, they're sort of quite uplifting and through that emotional uplift there's a sense of ownership that occurs people suddenly feel proud to, to live on the planet earth because they can see it and they realize how beautiful it is um and then that that hopefully yeah promotes a sense of uh change in their behavior perhaps in the long term 
Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, we've got a question here about favorite objects. I think this this will be to the curators, shall we say, and this is a perennially difficult question um, um, to answer. But let's say, let's give it some parameters. For these purposes, uh, what's your favorite object in our collections to elucidate the biodiversity loss and or the climate emergency? And as you both pause and think, I will go to Ashley first, because she looks like, because of how terrified Ellie looks. Um, I can't do that, Sam. I can't do that. <laughs> For a start, you've said object rather than specimen. So actually, maybe that was a get out clause. Maybe I don't have to choose an insect, um, because our collection doesn't just contain the specimens. We've got archives full of objects, so items that belong to some of our collectors, some of our donors. We've got things um, like their field equipment. Um, we have a jacket that belonged to uh, Ted Pelham Clinton, our previous moth curator. Um, so there's all sorts of wonderful things and it's really, really, really hard to choose. Um, I don't know that I can. Um, I think the best part of our collection is the diversity of it, the history of it, and that it is still having so many different uses. So I couldn't possibly, I couldn't possibly pick. Well dodged, Ashley. Uh, Ellie, do you, do, you want to, do you want to have a go? I'm going to be a terrible, predictable cliche and say that um, one of my favourite objects overall is our um, Bolton and Watt beam engine, which opened the short film that we, that we watched earlier. And I just think it's an incredible object in the way that it speaks to our, our heritage that's brought us to where we are now in terms of climate emergency, if that makes sense. Um, it can be used to, to illustrate our industrial history and sort of the, how our emissions ramped up to the incredible levels that they're at now that have brought us to this point in time where we need to um, review just about every aspect of how we live. And I think that the history of that object and just the way that it's been interpreted by the museum over time mirrors that that journey that we've gone through as a as a as humankind and fun fact um i believe it is the heaviest object in uh, across all the museum's 12.5 million items um is that right uh, that's probably not crucial to the to the to the case in point um, but we've got a great question here for the artists yeah they're coming in nice pairs the questions this evening for the artist this is from Ailey, and she asked how would the artists get the message of sustainability across to children so that they can in turn educate their parents? Um, and that's under that's pressure, it. yeah. Uh, um, Luke first, yeah. Yeah, so the way I, I don't really, I can't really come up with answers instantly. What I tend to do is I write down the questions and then I brainstorm 20 different solutions, uh, throw out most of them, and then you might find one that, that might might work so unfortunately i haven't got an answer for that straight away you'll have to come back to me in a few days <laughs> no problem at all it was a, sorry it was a, a, a great question a tricky one to answer philip um well we've had we've had a three-year-old in and we've had a 96 year old in and i think everyone has got the message i mean i guess it, it it's about telling your story in a way, in a direct way that that makes sense, and um, I, I think yeah, so far everyone seems to have got the the message that, that we're trying to convey. Um, and while you have the mic, um, Philip, as it were, there's a specific question to you asking what people's reactions have been when they um, when they visit uh, your installation. Well, that was. Yeah, that was quite surprising. So I talked about trying to connect with people emotionally and that's what art does. But actually, we've, uh, we were taken by surprise. Some people have, I mean, a lot of people have come out and said they were overwhelmed. I mean, it's only six or seven minutes and it's going, you know, you're going from, so you, you travel through, it's, it, you travel through the story quite quickly, but they've come out and said they were overwhelmed. They've had a few people in tears and... Uh, we were quite surprised by that. And I think I think that tells us something about what's wrong with our cities just now. If you can, by improving them a bit, you can reduce people to tears in six minutes, then I think, yeah, there's, there's something drastic that needs to change. And I, I guess also what people have recently had is this very memorable experience of, of a completely different city that was transformed overnight. And uh, maybe there's some connection with that.
but it's, uh, yeah, that was something that took us by surprise. But it, yeah, the reactions have, have, have all been good so far. It's a very, very powerful piece. Um, and then I think probably the, the, the final question of the evening, Ashley, will, will come to you. And this again is about art and insects. Um, uh, we have a question that goes, how do, how do you think we can use art to inspire people to become more engaged or in love even with insects, particularly children who may view uh, uh, these microfauna um, as boring or unimportant? I don't know any children who find them boring or unimportant, but how can we use art to get people <laughs> more engaged with our insect, with insects, do you think? I'm shocked, deeply shocked. In my experience, children are more, much more engaged with insects than adults. I don't know if that's something to do with them just being down on their level and being better at look, finding small things, yeah. Um, art is a great, I mean, art and nature combined is just so much fun. So I'm all for outdoor education um, and bringing the paints and everything outdoors as well so that kids can really hone in their observation skills um, and document um, some of the things that they're finding. Um, if, they can, if that can be insects, that's brilliant. If it's some of the other things, some of the plants and trees, that's also okay. Um, but outdoor education and outdoor art um, installations really appeal to me. And I think it's about having those um, moments, making those memories out in nature um, and really connecting with our environment. I think, I think I'd like to see that more. Super, thank you, Ashley. And then in the presence of, of two premier environmental artists, I think that's a, that's a really nice note to end on. And, you know, the questions are still coming in um, thick and fast, but um, for the sake of time, with regretfully, um, I'm going to need to, to draw us um, to, a, to a close just now. But look, um, as, as I've mentioned, um, we can continue the, these dialogues in the artworks themselves. Scotland's Climate Challenge, the Extinction Bell, and the And If Not Now When installations are all free to visit at the National Museum of Scotland. Um, for those of you who've joined us this evening, uh, we'll be in touch uh, with a short survey to help uh, shape the future of, um, of online programming like this. This will be really helpful to us. Um, and they'll include an opportunity to sign up to the museum newsletter, which is a great way to uh, keep informed of future events uh, like this and across the activities and the multidisciplinary spectrum that we work on. Um, finally, uh, on behalf of National Museum Scotland, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's made a donation with their ticket for tonight's event. As a charity, we use our exceptional natural science collections, our world-class scientific research, and our multidisciplinary approach to give us a platform in which to inspire and educate our audiences towards a better world. Now, we know times are tight, but if you can, please do consider making a donation and details of how to do so, as you might imagine, will appear on the screen shortly. But finally, I'd really like to thank um, both my curatorial colleagues for joining us. I'd like to thank both the artists who are over and above uh, and uh, beyond the call of duty have come in to, to help us this evening. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you from across the world for joining us for the art and science of the climate emergency. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Mm -hmm.